Bola Tinubu says Nigeria's unity is non-negotiable, assuring all citizens of fairness. House of Representatives asks INEC to delete dead voters from voters' register. Troops kill over 70 suspected terrorists and rescue two more abducted Chibo girls. And the foreign scene, Ukraine accuses Russian forces of committing over 60,000 war crimes in April alone. Good evening. This is News at 7 on Western Spring Television. My name is Femi Olani Pekun. The president-elect, Ebola Tinubu, has said the unity of Nigeria is non-negotiable, assuring all citizens that it will be fair to all. Tinubu spoke when he commissioned the magistrate court complex in Port Harcourt, the River State capital. The president-elect, who ended his two-day official visit to River State today, said Nigerians must tolerate one another. Tinubu said himself and River State Governor Yesom Wike, a chieftain of the People's Democratic Party, are promoting unity despite not being members of the same political party. The former Lagos State Governor also promised to review the welfare of judges after his sworn in on May 29, 2023. Tinubu was in the state alongside the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Gwajabia Mila, as well as some APC governors and former governors. It's not negotiable. That what is a wiki and I are promoting jointly. I promise I'll be fair to all. In another development, the River State governorship candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Tonye Cole, has explained the reasons he fails to visit the president-elect, Balatinubu, during his visits to the state inaugurate project. Cole cited negligence and Governor Yesam Wiki's non-challenge amongst other reasons why he was absent from the inauguration. Tinubu had visited the state yesterday on the invitation of Governor Wiki to inaugurate the Rumo Okuta, Rumo La flyover in Port Harcourt, where he described Wiki as a man of integrity who abandoned his interest for the nation's interest. The APC governorship candidate stated these while speaking in an interview today, adding that Wiki should have informed the state chapter of the APC if he really wanted them to be part of the program. And I will describe the visit in two, uh, from two sides. The first side of it is the president-elect. As the president-elect of Nigeria, he has every right to go anywhere. And River State government, as a government, invited him, and he has come. He's honored that invitation as pre president-elect and has come to River State as president-elect. With that, we have no problem at all. Where the issue is, is that the governor of River State, Nyesom Wike, ought to also be the governor of all reverse people. And one of the things that he should have done, if inviting the president-elect, who is the president-elect of all Nigeria, would have been to call us as APC in River State to inform us that he is inviting the president-elect and would want us to be part of that program. We never got any invitation. I wasn't invited personally. I was not invited in my capacity as a candidate. Neither was our party, APC in River State, invited to any of these things. And I believe that that is where the, the difference between the president-elect acting in his capacity as the president-elect for all of Nigeria and Governor Yeson Wike acting in his capacity as governor of just the uh, particular section of Rivers people. And still in Rivers State, Governor Inye Wiki has named a block in the newly inaugurated Justice Iche Ndu Magistrate Court Complex in the state after his wife, Justice Eberich Inye Wiki. The governor will disclose these during the inauguration of the complex today, also named other blocks after some top judicial officers in the state. Wiki said he decided to name one block after his wife, 
so as not to leave office empty-handed, having named other structures after distinguished justices. The governor also explained that he named one of the complex blocks after a former chief judge of the state, Justice Iche Undu, because he contributed to the growth of the judiciary. The complex was inaugurated by the president-elect, Bola Tinubu, who has been in the state since Wednesday when he inaugurated the Rumo Kuta, Rumo La Flyover. My problem is not this editing. My problem is the maintenance. Because I feel so bad that you build a structure like this and those who are responsible for it, you come back here in the next six months, you ask yourself, why did I even embark upon this? Beautiful as it is, I hope in the next six months, it will still be like this. When you enter into the courtrooms, the air conditions will be working. When you enter into the toilets, it will be working, water will flow. Not a situation where you come here, oh, the water is not flowing. What happened? There's no desire to pump uh, water. All kinds of excuses. So what I have done, and I've told the CJ, look, you are the chief judge. It will be unfair in your tenure that you can maintain this edifice. It will be quite unfair. Put it in your budget. I will plead with my successor that he releases this money to you and let them farm it out to give to people whose responsibility is to keep it clean. In the meantime, a former head of state, Yakubu Gawan, has urged Nigerians to accept the decisions of the court as final when delivered. This is coming as the Presidential Petitions Tribunal has fixed May 8th for commencement of hearing. Gowan also urged Nigerians to allow the courts to do its work without interference as the judiciary plays a pivotal role in the unity of the country. Following the February 25th presidential election, the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, Ainak Mahamud Yakubu, had on March the 1st declared all progressives Congress Bola Tinubu the president-elect on the grounds that his party scored the majority of votes cast in the polls. He had polled 8.8 .8 million votes to defeat Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party, Peter Obi of the Labour Party, and 15 others. However, Atiku and Obi are disputing the result, filing separate petitions seeking others to annul the election or declare them the winners of the polls. Staying with politics, as consultations within the ruling All Progressives Congress APC for the planned zoning of the leadership of the 10th National Assembly continues, a group, the Niger Delta Rights Advocate, has called for the zoning of the Speaker of the House of Representatives to the Southeast Geopolitical Zone. The group at a press briefing in Port Harcourt, the River State Capital, said, the APC must get it right by sourcing for a nationalist in the southeast for the position. The national coordinator of the group, Bright Ngolo, explained that zoning the speaker to the southeast would bring about fairness and sense of belonging. The group noted that while it is not out of place to lobby for the position of the speaker of the lower chamber, merit and competence should be placed above religious and ethnic considerations. And in Cross River State, barely 25 days to the end of his administration, Governor Ben Ayade has appointed five permanent secretaries to the state public service. The elevation from the position of directors to permanent secretaries was announced in a statement today by the head of service, Timothy Akwaji. The five permanent secretaries are Ushir Peter, Irek Esikwe, Atim Ekwayong, Emmanuel Egban, and Abu Ayo. Akwaji said their appointments take effect from April the 27th, 2023. The House of Representatives has asked the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to develop a system to delete dead voters from the voters' register. This was a resolution of the lawmakers after a motion of urgent national importance by a member, Leke Abejide, drawing the attention of the House to what he described 
as irregularities observed during the 2023 general elections. Abejide will move to the motion, said his late father's name was seen in the INEC register. The lawmakers further urged the Electoral Commission to deregister any voter who does not vote in two election cycles. Earlier, the House directed the National Assembly clerk to transmit the bill for constitution amendment to provide for uniform retirement age for judicial officers and pension rights to President Muhammad Buhari. The constitutional bill, if assented to by the President, will extend the retirement age of high court judges from 65 to 70 years. And away from politics, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, has asked the Court of Appeal sitting in Lagos to declare the purported pardon granted to an Indian businessman, Ashok Israni, and three others by the Lagos State Government unconstitutional, null, and void. Addressing a special panel of the appellate court during the hearing of the appeal filed by Israni and two officials of Keystone Bank, Anayo Nwosu and Olajide Oshudi, the EFCC counsel, Rotimi Jacob, submitted that there are excess of legal authorities to show that pardon cannot be granted to convict whose rights of appeal have not been exhausted. Before the matter went on appeal, Justice Kudurat Jose of the Lagos State High Court sitting in Igbosheri and on December 9, 2019, convicted Israni and two officials of Keystone Bank, Anna Yungosu and Alajide Oshudi, on an amended 15-count charge bordering on conspiracy and obtaining by false pretense to the tune of 855 million naira. The judge had sentenced them to five years imprisonment each for stealing. The court also convicted Nolik Industries Limited belonging to Israni and Keystone Bank Limited in hard judgment. In another development, operatives of the Enugu Zonal Command of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, have arrested 18 suspected internet fraudsters in a sting operation in Enugu. Items recovered from them include mobile phones, laptops, and a Mercedes Benz. Similarly, Operatives of the Benin Zonal Command of the EFCC also arrested 34 suspected internet fraudsters in Ogara, Delta State. The EFCC noted that the suspects have made useful statements and will be charged to court soon. You're watching News at 7 on Western Spring Television. Still to come, Sudan's ambassador to Nigeria asks Nigerian evacuees to return to Sudan after crisis goes off. We'll bring you more on this story when we return. to 1953 pitched North and South Korea against each other in response to intrigues by nations beyond their border with different interests from those canvassed by the two brother nations. The Korean War had all the nuances of an external conflict induced by powers that were interested in subjugating North and South Korea. Japan had leveraged on its military power to annex Korea in 1900 and imposed a military union that did not sit well with the citizens. Japan not only lost its war of conquest against Korea, all its powers were obliterated by the effect of the World War II. The end of World War II got Korea divided into two nations along 38 parallel lines by the instrumentality of the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. The Korean War lapsed into a Cold War when it stopped the prying eyes of external forces into the internal affairs of a nation now divided along its north and southern territories. Western Spring Television identifies the Korean War as a major event in history. The 
1914 Amalgamation Treaty is synonymous to the birth of Nigeria. Frederick Lugard, a British Army captain and an outlaw who struck gold in Africa became the instrument used by destiny to make it happen. The Amalgamation of Nigeria was designed for economic reasons by the colonial administration to offset Northern Protectorate budget deficit by Southern Protectorate surplus returns. The Amalgamation had ad issue created imbalance in the economic political structure of Nigeria and was responsible for the persistent hiccups and the efforts to forge a united country till today. Nigeria's amalgamation was labeled as the mistake of 1914 by native northern conservatives who neither wanted it nor contributed anything significant to its sustenance. Western Springer Television identifies with Amalgamation Treaty of 1914 as a watershed event in history. You're welcome back. This is still news at 7 on Western Spring Television. A reminder of our headlines. The president-elect, Bela Tinubu, has said the unity of Nigeria is non-negotiable, assuring all citizens that it will be fair to all. The House of Representatives has asked the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to develop a system to delete dead voters from the voters' register. Troops of the Nigerian military have killed over 70 suspected terrorists in counter-resurgency operations in the northeast region and rescued two more girls abducted from Chibok local government area of Baronu State. And on the foreign scene, Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky has accused Russian forces of committing some 6,139 war crimes in April alone. The International Human Rights Commission, IHRC, has appealed to the government of the United Kingdom for leniency and the sentencing of former Nigeria Deputy Senate President E.K. Kweremadu, alongside his wife Beatrice and Obin Naibeta, who was found guilty and convicted under the Modern Slavery Act of the United Kingdom by the Central Criminal Court Old Bailey, London. IHRC's ambassador at large and head of the diplomatic mission to the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Duru Hezekiah, said Senator Kwerimadu is a patriotic Nigerian who has served the Nigerian Senate three consecutive times since 2003. He has cried that Senator Kwerimadu acted on the poor view of parental instincts to save his daughter and not for commercial purposes, as well may be ignorance of the law of the United Kingdom adding that a distinguished personality and lawmaker of that repute would not involve himself in such abominable act. The trial of former Speaker of the Lagos State House of Assembly, Adeyemi Ikufo-Riji, on allegations of laundering of over 338.8 million naira has resumed at the Federal High Court sitting in Ikoyi. Ikufo-Riji who took the witness box today to testify in a no-case submission application he made before the court, told Justice Mohammed Liban that a charge preferred against him by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, was politically motivated. While denying the money laundering allegation leveled against him by the commission, Ikuforiji said the initial allegations made against him by the EFCC were for fraud and misappropriation of funds, which the commission later turned to money laundering. Ikufo Riji said as a three-term speaker of the Lagos State House of Assembly, if he had indeed committed such an infraction, his case would not first to get to the EFCC for trial, as members of the House would have dealt with him by first impeaching him before handing him over to the law enforcement agency. Denying the allegation of money laundering leveled against him, Ikufo Riji said as the head of the legislative arm of government, his role in any financial issue is to give final approval on any memo put before him after the office of the clerk and that of the finance department have done their bit. In other news, Sudan's ambassador to Nigeria, Mohammed Yusuf, has asked the Nigerian evacuees to return to the North African country after the crisis cools off. 
Yusuf made the request in the early hours of today, shortly after some evacuated Nigerians arrived at the Inamdi Azikwe International Airport Abuja. The Nigerians arrived in the country after spending nearly a week stranded in Egypt over visa and border clearance issues. They had previously spent two weeks in Sudan, waiting for evacuation from the federal government. Yusuf asked them to consider Sudan as the second country, expressing optimism that the chaos would be controlled soon. He said the government had proposed another humanitarian truce, but insisted that there would be no negotiations between the army and the rapid support forces. Meanwhile, the chairperson of the Nigerians in diaspora, Abike Dabiri Rewa, while receiving the evacuees, said the first two sets have arrived despite delays. There were a lot of delays, there were logistics issues, but alhamdulillah, with, what, with the inter-agency collaboration, we're able to have we'll, uh, the first the two sets here, and everybody will be back. And uh, war is a terrible thing. I mean, we never witnessed war in our country. I mean, the war is Sudan, the over -sun. The Director General of the National Agency for Prohibition of Trafficking and Persons, NAPTIP, Fatima Waziri Yazi, has said Nigerian women working in Iraq are exploited in diverse ways. The DG disclosed these in a statement while speaking on the plight of young women, saying that most of them worked as domestic workers in Iraq and were exploited on a daily basis. Waziri Yazi said most of the young Nigerian women were now requesting for assistance to return home. She said that NAPTIP was currently investigating several rogue labor recruiters who had been reported to be big players in the massive recruitment of Nigerians to Iraq for domestic servitude. The DG also said awareness by the agency and other partners in the well-known destination countries across the globe had now made traffickers to shift attention to Iraq. Waziri Azi stated that Nigerian women were constantly being sexually harassed by members of the household where they were serving, and these aggravated the situation. Talking security, troops of the Nigerian military have killed over 70 suspected terrorists in counter-resurgency operations in the northeast region and rescued two more girls abducted from Chibok local government area of Boronu State. The Director of Defense Media Operations, Major General Musa Damundami, Disclose these today while briefing journalists about the operations of the military in the last two weeks. He said more than 140 terrorists were also arrested during the period with several weapons, including improvised explosive devices, recovered. According to the defense spokesman, over 500 members of the Islamic State of West Africa province, Iswap, have surrendered to the military. And while the military has also confirmed that two of the Chibok schoolgirls abducted in April 2014 have been rescued in addition to over 150 other civilians rescued during various military operations in the Northeast. In Kano State, a teenager has stabbed his own mother, Jumai, to death over a disagreement. According to reports, the incident happened around 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday. The suspect fled the scene shortly after committing a heinous crime against his mother. And while the deceased was later carried to a hospital in a tricycle with blood all over her body, or was pronounced dead upon arrival. Police spokesperson in the state, SP Abdullahi Haruna, confirmed the incident, adding that investigation into the incident had commenced, and the police have assured the public that the perpetrator of the crime would be brought to justice. Despite the federal government's announcement and various measures to address passport scarcity and rocketeering by immigration officials and their collaborators, it seems getting passport is still tedious and not hitch free as Nigerians still complain bitterly on how hard the process still looks. In this report, Olayi Kali spoke with some Nigerians who narrated their experiences at the immigration office. Most Nigerians have been subjected to unnecessary and severe stress whenever they apply or attempt to renew their international passport at home and abroad. Nigerians in diaspora like Bolaji Gray in a video complaint that a name like his others is not in the database, meaning she could not get a passport as at the time she needed it. All right. 
Hi, my name is Bola G. Gray. I am in front of the Nigerian Embassy. We're here to, I'm here to get my passport. There's a lot of people in the building right now waiting to get their passport. But unfortunately, some of us cannot get the passport because we have issues with our I and I. Uh, we are told it's not yet in the system. It's not in the database. The situation is worse for applicants here in Nigeria. Procedurally, the NIS has a standard online process for application or renewal of passport on its official website. However, applicants who rely on this procedure are hardly succeed because the unofficial criminal process that thrives on bribery frustrates the official procedure. Temitokwe Lokontoye had a conversation with her news team described his mother-in-law's experience at the immigration office as brutal because the old woman just got a passport after a year of applying. In, but in recent time, the, the response has been a very unfriendly one. My mother-in-law, to specific, applied sometimes around June last year, 2022, and until recently, about two weeks ago, now was she was able to get her passport. The process has become something else. They, 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 they make payment to the right uh, uh, place, but eventually they, they, they will keep give you a complaint that your, your, your batch is not out, your this is not out. And I, I quite, I'm quite aware that those who are able to give them a very uh, junky sum of money were, were, were given express service delivery. So if you have to compare what happens now to what used to be, it's a very strenuous one. For Olua Femi Ademola, who applied by himself on the official website of the NIS, his passport was shortly delayed, but he however got it after the stipulated time. The day I went to uh, the day I went to uh, immigration office for for my international passport, I went there on that day. They said I should come after two weeks to collect it. After after that two weeks, I went there again. They said that I should come back after a month. Something that that uh, even two or three days, everything has been finished. So after a month, by God's grace, I I take everything. Lanre Adedayo is a Nigerian who resides in the United Kingdom. He stated also that the process of getting the Nigerian passport is tedious. Speaking from experience, unlike that of the British, whose process is seamless. I mean, from my own experience, which would have been a few years ago, I don't know how it is now. It, it was quite strenuous in terms of going through the whole process. Because usually I can compare it with in terms of the British passport and the Nigerian one. With the Nigerian one, it, it takes, God knows, I, I think there's initially a waiting. <laughs> First of all, you, you have to, you get there 7 a.m. and then you are given a number or whatever but the whole process for the day takes maybe six hours or whatever but this was a few years ago like i said um in terms of against the british passport you just fill your form drop it at a local post office and there you go they, they mail it to you and the other thing with the nigerian one is that you are required to maybe put pay a postal order or something and then the whole process shy yeah, is just stressful <laughs> Responding to the glaring malpractices and exploitation at the NIS offices, a former NIS officer and a lawyer who spoke on the condition of anonymity blamed the government for the problem. According to him, the NIS system needs a strong character who believes in the country and who has the mental, physical and intellectual capacity to drive the agency to the point where it realizes that it is a service-oriented agency, not a revenue-yielding agency. Ola Inka Ali, Western Spring Television News. Moving on, President Muhammadu Buhari has claimed all campaign promises he made to Nigerians in 2015 have been fulfilled. The president insisted he had delivered in the areas of economy, education, security, anti-corruption and other areas. He said his campaign vows centered on enriching the economy, enhancing security and the fight against corruption. President Buhari said it that at his inauguration, the country was practically under siege of terrorism and other forms of insecurity. However, some Nigerians like Olamile Kombakari, Kenide, Olumide, Kunle, Okejimi, favored Joshua are of the opinion that the president has not delivered on his promises. 
Some other Nigerians, like Lawal Chinyabola, feel Buhari delivered in his capacity but blamed his cabinet members for the failures recorded. Okay, Buhari said he has delivered everything that he he has he promised us in Nigeria, but I don't think that is true because um, the people are shouting for hunger, the people are shouting for um, a new Nigeria, and we believe that is um, going to happen soon. But I don't think Buhari has done what Buhari deliver. Ah, uh, not really like that, but she tries own. But everybody is trying. Let me just have everybody is trying, but deliver, no. Ah, to me, I wouldn't say he's, he has, he's saying the truth because he has not really fulfilled all he has promised. Mm, for where? They play. I did not say anything, no. He has not said anything. It's just. My... Now, it depends on the, the way and the angle you look at it. Because uh, by the time he came to power, he promised uh, every night, he promised this and that. Nobody is perfect, 100% perfect. But you have to look at one angle. All, most of these uh, contracts awarded uh, or given out, like maybe railway has performed on that ground and other things. But if you look at those people behind him, people supporting him, people doing this and that, they are those people to be blamed. Many residents of Oshun State, especially Oshibu and surrounding towns, have lamented the poor power supply they have been experiencing in the past few years. According to some of them, the situation has affected their daily lives and taken tolls on business activities in the state, with many residents starting to have a rethink on their stay. Joseph Atewe completes the report. For many years, Oshun State was where businesses could thrive and people living comfortable because of the constant electricity, which was far better than any other state in Nigeria. At the point, its power supply became the envy of the two big boys of the southwest, Lagos and Oyo, as Oshun boasted of at least 18 hours uninterrupted power supply daily. Benga Olawi has lived in Oshogo for more than 15 years. He explained to us what life looked like during the days where you only charge your phone when the battery is almost down, iron your clothes only when you want to go out or use your generator to run your business once in a month, all because of the constant electricity. Business was good, at least for the business uh, people, those people we sell to, those people we supply, they were happy. They, even we at home were happy. I still remember that in Oshogo, you, you, you are leaving your house, you just need to post your you just need to post your DVD, go out, come back, and you continue watching your movie. Mr. Olawi's experience is a sharp contrast to today's realities. Recently, residents of Oshun State, especially Oshobo, and surrounding towns like Agumbelewu, Owodiede, and Kajola complained bitterly about the plastic power supply they have been experiencing in the past few years. Grace Adebanjo, a resident of Oshobo, ran a bakery business successfully for years because of constant power supply but now she's finding life difficult and for most of her friends shutting down their businesses was the only option because of the bad electricity supply in a state that was once envied by many light is a major like let's say one of the main thing that we need for our business if you have to bake you need light but now we run on generator so if you are to make your costing you just have to hard fill to your costing if you are giving them a costing of 5000 naira as of 2014 Right now, a 2014 product of 5,000 naira is likely 15,000 naira right now. There is increase when there is increase in fall. There will be increase in products because people bringing in flour, uh, butter, they will surely have their own too. With some businesses shutting down and residents no longer enjoying the life they signed up for because of their plastic power supply, we visited the Badon Electricity Distribution Company in Oshobo to ascertain the costs. Kike Lomo Oweye, the public relations officer, disclosed that the influx of people into the state and the level of investment contributed immensely to the problem. If you look at those years, you're talking about the population then, compared to now, it's um, well over, I think it would have in, increased 
drastic, um, uh, so geographically or something. And if you look at it, you see that what we used to have then, maybe residence-wise, uh, population-wise, human resources and all of that was quite different from what we're experiencing right now. We are having a lot of uh, people coming into Ocean State day by day. We are having a lot of um, development, economic-wise, social-wise. It's not the way it used to be with infrastructure and um, economically in those years, 2017, 2015, and right now. Mrs. Awoye further stated that communities in the state has been divided to different categories. Hence, some areas will continue to have light more than the other as the tariffs they pay is different, so they deserve more. Uh, policy that came up through the federal government, it's called service reflective tariff. Service reflective tariff um, actually um, differentiates people from the feeders they use. Feeders in the sense that the network that they use in supplying electricity to every area. Well, then we add the band A, band B, band C, band D, and E. And they were divided into different hourly, uh, hourly availability. I will let you know that the amount of um, the units they get, the amount of tariff they get, it's different from what band A will get, band B will get, and band C will get. Definitely, they are not paying the same tariff. Residents of Oshun State are calling on the electricity distribution companies to do more in providing good power supply to help improve their businesses, which was once thriving. Joseph Atewe, Western Spring Television. To education, the West African Examinations Council, WIAC, has said a total of 1,621,853 candidates from 20,851 secondary schools have registered for the 2023 West African Senior School Certificate Examination for School Candidates. The head of the Nigerian office, Patrick Aregan, during a press briefing today, he said the OASC would take place between Monday, the 8th of May, and Friday, the 23rd of June, 2023, in Nigeria, spanning a period of seven weeks. He added that candidates would be examined in 76 subjects, saying about 30,000 practicing senior secondary school teachers nominated by the various states' ministries of education would be participating in the examination as supervisors. Aregan added that schools that failed to upload the continuous assessment score within the expected time frame after several free upload periods face possible penalties. The regulatory body for the teaching profession in Nigeria, the Teachers Registration Council, TRCN, has claimed that over 90% of private school teachers in Southwest states are unqualified. According to the registrar of the TRC and Josiah Jiboye, the teachers are unqualified due to their lack of qualifications to enable them to register with the council. Speaking in Abuja today, when the council signed a memorandum of understanding with a South African-based educational organization in steel education to upskill and service teachers in Nigeria, Ajiboye said a pilot phase of implementation of the MOU will soon commence with capacity building for eight weeks. Ajiboye also stated that the MOU has three major components, which include pre-service teachers, integrating pre-service with in-service teachers, and their capacity building programs, while expressing confidence that involvement of instilled education would bridge the gap between pre-service and in-service teachers. And now on the foreign scene, Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky has accused Russian forces of committing some 6,139 war crimes in April alone. Mr. Zelensky made this known in his address to the International Criminal Court in The Hague this morning, noting that the crimes have led to the deaths of 207 Ukrainian civilians, including 11 children. He further called for the creation of a war tribunal which must transform the experience of the Nuremberg process.
Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky on Thursday visited the International Criminal Court in The Hague, which in March issued an arrest warrant for Russian President Vladimir Putin for suspected deportation of children from Ukraine, calling for the creation of a war crimes tribunal separate to the International Criminal Court. He is expected to meet with Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte, as well as members of the country's parliament, in his first visit to the Netherlands. President Zelensky started a speech titled No Peace Without Justice for Ukraine by thanking his audience for having him in The Hague. Speaking in English, he expressed his gratitude for their attention and respect for his country and for those who value freedom and do not tolerate tyranny. We can now stop wars of aggression as such. We can defeat aggression as a criminal idea that originates in the mindset of someone who is used to impunity. Impunity is the key that opens the door to aggression. If you look at any war, any, any war of aggression in the history, they all have one thing in common. The perpetrators of the war didn't believe they would have to stand to answer for what they did. They must stand to answer for war. However, brings war must receive judgment. Russia, which is not a member of the ICC and rejects its jurisdiction, denies committing atrocities during its conflict with Ukraine, which are terms of special operation to demilitarize its neighbor. The Ukrainian president says some 6,139 war crimes have been committed by Russians alone in April. He added that these crimes have led to the deaths of 207 Ukrainian civilians, including 11 children. He mentioned an attack on Kherson yesterday, which killed 23 and injured another 49. The millions of strikes in the Donbass region, people killed during the occupation of Bucha, an alleged filtration camp that Russia has set up in Ukraine's independent land, as well as every prisoner tortured in Russian captivity in every city bombed by Russia. In light of all the attacks by Russia, Zelensky led a minute of silence in memory of the lives lost following the invasion. Zelensky thanked the Dutch political leadership for being with Ukraine on its part. He also praised the Netherlands for honoring the memories of lives lost in the Second World War. While the ICC does not have jurisdiction over alleged crimes of aggression, the European Commission, among others, have already brought its support for the creation of a separate international center for the prosecution of the crime of aggression in Ukraine that would be set up in The Hague. Russia has accused Ukraine of attempting an overnight drone attack on the Kremlin with the aim of killing President Vladimir. Putin, the most dramatic charge Moscow has leveled against Kyiv since the war on its neighbor began. The allegation was made on Wednesday by the Russian government. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky denied the accusations, saying his country had not attacked Moscow or its president. We don't attack Putin or Moscow. Uh, we fight on, on our territory. We are defending our villages and cities. We don't have, you know, enough weapon for this. That's why we don't use it any, anywhere. For, for us, that is the deficit. We, we can't spend it. And we didn't attack Putin. We leave it to tribunal. Western Spring Television News. In the United States, White House National Security Spokesman John Kirby says Russia's claims that the U.S. was behind a drone attack on the Kremlin are false. Mr. Kirby in a news chart said the United States was in no way involved with the incident, adding that Washington does not encourage or enable Ukraine to strike outside its borders. Mr. Kirby further stated that it was still unclear what exactly happened and that Washington was still looking into the incident. Earlier, Russia had accused the United States of being behind what it says was a drone attack on Moscow's Kremlin citadel intended to kill President Vladimir Putin. 
I would just tell you, Mr. Peskov's lying. I mean, that's obviously it's a ludicrous claim. The United States had nothing to do with this. We don't even know exactly what happened here, uh, Caitlin, but I can assure you the United States had had no role in it whatsoever. And and again, just to be clear, and I think you covered this at the beginning, uh, we neither encourage nor do we enable Ukraine to strike outside Ukraine's borders. And uh, But we honestly just don't know what happened here. I, I think here, here's another thing that happened, though, Poppy. Sure. Uh, in just the last 48 hours or so, uh, Mr. Putin has continued to rain down on Ukraine cruise missiles and drones and conducting other kinds of air, airstrikes. And, and just yesterday, killed 23 innocent civilians uh, in a residential complex that, that, that they hit, uh, likely intentionally. So that's, that's also what's happening. And I think we, uh, we can't Our forget that. And still in the United States, police have arrested a suspect in a mass shooting at a medical center that killed one person and wounded four, after which the gunman stole a truck and fell the scene. The suspect identified as Dion Patterson, aged 24, was taken into custody yesterday without incident after an undercover officer spotted him north of Atlanta, hours after the midday shooting at a north side medical facility in the capital of the southern state of Georgia. Atlanta's Deputy Police Chief of Criminal Investigations, Charles Hampton, disclosed at a news briefing that the suspect had an appointment at the facility, but the motive for the shooting is still under investigation. Atlanta Police Chief Darren Schoenbaum told an earlier news conference that it was too early in the investigation to determine if the five women who were shot were patients or employees. We're asking for the movement of humanitarian supplies and people. We do this in every other country. Even with our ceasefires, we, it's a tradition of the humanitarian enterprise to go where others don't. We will need to have agreement at the highest level and very publicly, and we will need to deliver those commitments into local arrangements that can be depended on. Elsewhere, the UN's top aid official has warned that the will to end the conflict still is not there after speaking to Sudan's rival military leaders. Martin Griffiths told the BBC that Sudan's descent into violence was now at a dangerous tipping point. He further called for security guarantees from the warring sides to allow humanitarian aid into the country. The UN warns that the fighting could force hundreds of thousands of Sudanese to flee their homes. We're asking for the movement of humanitarian supplies and people. We do this in every other country. Even with our ceasefires, we, it's a tradition of the humanitarian enterprise to go where others don't. We will need to have agreement at the highest level and very publicly, and we will need to deliver those commitments into local arrangements that can be depended on. And here in Africa, one of Kenya's highest profile pastors appeared in the dock today in connection with the horrific discovery last month of dozens of bodies in mass graves. Ezekiel Odero, a wealthy televangelist who boasts a huge following, is being investigated on a raft of charges including murder, aiding suicide, abduction, radicalization, crimes against humanity, child cruelty, fraud, and money laundering. Prosecutors accuse Adero of links to cult leader Paul McKinsey, who is in custody facing terrorism charges over the deaths of more than 100 people, many of them children, in what has been dubbed the Shakahola Forest Massacre. McKenzie, the head of the Good News International Church, is alleged to have incited his followers to starve to death in order to meet Jesus in a case that has deeply shocked Kenyans. And still in Africa, 17 people were killed when a truck and a bus collided on a motorway in southern Egypt today. According to the Health Ministry, another 29 people were injured and 26 ambulances were sent to the scene of the accident on the road between southern cities of Karga and Asyut. Egypt's roads are dangerous and often badly maintained, and drivers often break speed limits and other traffic rules. With a population of more than 105 million, Egypt is the Arab world's most populous country. According to official figures, in 2021, there were 7,000 deaths caused by traffic accidents. In Europe, 
eight people have died in a fire in the second largest city in the Czech Republic. The fire broke out this morning in Bruno, located 125 miles southeast of Prague. The victims are yet to be identified. A police suggested those who died were likely unhoused people occupying construction containers at a new neighborhood that is expected to be built in the coming years. According to local TV, the fire engulfed about 12 containers on the edge of an apartment complex before being extinguished. And still ahead, U.S. Central Bank raises interest rates to the highest level in 16 years. We have more on these and other business stories after this break. Please do stay with us. Welcome back. And now to business. The United States Central Bank has raised interest rates to the highest level in 16 years as it battles to stabilize prices. The Federal Reserve increased its key interest rate by 0.25 percentage points, its 10th hike in 14 months. That pushed its benchmark rate to between 5% and 5.25%, up from near zero in March 2022. The European Central Bank has also raised rates again, although by a smaller amount than in previous months. The European Central Bank lifted its three key interest rates by 0.25 percentage points, whereas the three preceding meetings have all seen larger rise. The federal government, through the Ministry of Aviation, has announced a massive investment of about $23.7 billion Naira for the expansion of the Katsina Airport, establishment of the fire truck maintenance overhaul, and a cargo center. The Minister of Aviation, Hadi Sirika, disclosed these are the groundbreaking ceremony of the expansion of Umar Musa Yaradwa International Airport, Katsina State, today. According to Sirika, these new developments will further bolster the air transportation sector and also improve economic activities in Katsina State. Sirika said the airport expansion project had cost 14 billion naira and all the equipment needed had been procured and was in place, awaiting the completion of the building. He said that the project was about 60% complete and that the terminal building, which will cost approximately 7 billion naira, will be finished in six months. And some sports stories now. Roma boss Jose Marino says he wore a microphone to protect himself against the worst referee he had met in his life during his side's one all draw with Monza yesterday. Marino criticized the referee Daniel Schiffi after he sent off Roma's Mehmet Zeki Selic in his 96th minute. He has received three red cards this season for disputes with officials, including one from Schiffi in September. Marino, speaking after the game, said he went to the game with a microphone, noting that from the moment he left the locker room to the moment he returned, he recorded everything. The lambasted Sheffy has the worst technically with zero empathy, zero communication, and zero awareness. Steven El Sharawi's opening goal was cancelled out by Monza's Luca Cadirola, with the results leaving Roma 7th in Serie A. And Spain's professional soccer clubs have reduced their losses in 2021-2022 by more than six times to 140 million euros as revenues rose by 23%, largely recovering from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. La Liga announced this, stating that the season's net deficit was the smallest amongst Europe's five main leagues, which lost a combined 3.1 billion euros. La Liga expects the current season to produce a net profit of just below 30 million euros, still far from levels reached in the pre-COVID years. COVID restrictions hit ticket sales and player transactions in 2020-2021 leading to the Spanish League's first loss since 2012. 
And that's all at this hour. But before we go, here is a recap of our major stories. The president-elect, Bola Tinubu, has said the unity of Nigeria is non-negotiable, assuring all citizens that they will be fair to all. The House of Representatives has asked the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to develop a system to delete dead voters from the voters' register. And troops of the Nigerian military have killed over 70 suspected terrorists in counter-resurgency operations in the northeast region. And rescued two more girls abducted from Chibok local government area of Baranu State. And a foreign scene, Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky has accused Russian forces of committing some 6,139 war crimes in April alone. But please do follow us on all of our social media handles on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Western Spring Television. You can also watch us live on our YouTube channel at Western Spring Television. My name is Femi Olani Kwekun. Please have a sweet night rest. Good night.